Good, good. Uh, can you hear us clearly? I can hear you just fine. All right, wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful to see. I read a lot about your work and uh, wonderful to be able to connect. Good to connect with you. Already. Uh, very happy to meet you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we'll probably get started because we're <clears throat> recording this. Um, later on, we can make it live. And um, I think today, today online, as you might know, our uh, small circle um of friends <laughs> and uh i guess they have the privilege to hear this live <laughs> and uh Thank you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> are you in are you in the uh, east coast uh, toronto no i live in vancouver the west oh okay all right so i'm less guilty so it's, it's not too late it's uh 6 p.m that's correct it's, oh, it's okay easy time all right, perfect. <laughs> All righty. Um, okay, so I think maybe we'll start, uh, we'll give, uh, people will start joining, so we don't have to wait because we will record this anyway. And then, um, and uh, I, 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 uh, I will attempt to introduce you because you have such a long and uh, fruitful life. <laughs> so it must be an understatement, uh, whatever I say. Uh, but I thought at least gave people an overview of, um, of of yourself and what you do. Um, so Marilyn um, uh, Atkinson actually she has founded. I had this question why the why the coaching uh, firm is called Ericsson instead of her own last name. <laughs> I guess the reason because she was so inspired by um, Milton Erickson's work. You right? got it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and over um over the years so she has basically named um, her own coaching institution after him uh with the approach developed by him and but she is really propagating this entire approach the benefit now i think over 45,000 people worldwide oh, well i've this. done the full art and science of coaching program yeah i yeah, know a lot and of I people <laughs> impacts a lot of people in 114 countries <laughs> and and also I think it's a of course yourself as well and then you know through this process not only building a business but I'm sure uh, you are living the journey yourself um, and then that's what's inspiring mm -hmm. about you and what I'm <laughs> really looking forward that's to being, isn't it Lino it's yeah absolutely you know, that what we're up to, living the game. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And now you're 80 years old, but you're looking as young as you're 35. So <laughs> we're looking at another 50 years to go, I guess. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, okay, I think so. Um, for um, maybe if, if you don't mind, uh, Marilyn, I know whatever I say is something, of course, I read about you, but if you don't mind, maybe introduce yourself briefly to the audience um, mm -hmm. so that people can hear from you directly. That will be great uh, as a start. Well, uh, I'm very honored to be here with you, Eno, because I know that you are a human development specialist, and that is what I am. My focus is on our human journey. My focus is on our human heart and how we grow it and how we learn through the passage of life to really be able to listen to each other. Now, for that purpose, I started a large coaching company. What is now a large coaching company? Erickson Coaching International. And Erickson, as you mentioned, is in many countries. And it's spread because it's not only uh, focuses on how we grow, really, and how we assist others to grow, but it gives easy principles and workable methods that when people practice them, they really learn. So I've been up to coaching for about 40 years of my life. <laughs> and if you were to ask me uh, to tell you who I am, yes, I'm the president of Erickson Coaching International, but I'm also someone who is a, a journeyer. I'm into having 
every one of us find our way on the path of life. That's what I'm up to. <laughs> wow, beautifully said. Thank you so much <clears throat> for sharing that. Um, and I, I think this time I will probably use more as opportunity for us to learn about you and um, and because it's such you you have this wealth of both experience and also I think this must be a very deep inner journey you've gone through yourself. Um, so I will be more interviewing you this time. <laughs> and, uh, oh, that's fine. I, I'm quite story. very curious about you too. Yeah, happy to share a bit when we get there. But um, but I think most because most of the audience um, on this platform knows me quite a bit already um and so it must be boring for them to hear it to hear it again <laughs> but i i'm happy to do them you know if we if we, if we can if we can catch up later as well for me to fill you a bit uh, more on myself um Mary, if you don't mind because you've uh, been doing this for 40 years can you take us to the start of this like how did you um decide to enter into coaching to start uh, Eric's International? Oh, there's a lot of stories about that. Uh, and they're not all great ones, you know. Uh, first of all, at one point, I was uh, beginning to become a teacher and a trainer. I was teaching uh, solution-focused psychology, which is Milton Erickson's work. I was directly working with his work and I had a two-year program and coaching was coming in. I mean, uh, I I loved the fact that his work, every time people talked about coaching, I think, well, that's what we're doing already. Milton Erickson's work is solution focused. It's about how people grow and learn and think. So I was a student of this great teacher. And uh, well, let me describe him for a minute. He was, he got polio when he was 15 years old and uh, woke up one morning after being uh, in a coma and all he could move was his eyeballs. <laughs> Can you imagine as a 15 year old? And uh, all they could do with him was put him in a uh, iron lung. And they put that iron lung in his mother's kitchen. And in the kitchen, she was busy working. She had three children, younger ones. She had a newborn baby girl. And she had a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Now, this newborn was just learning how to raise her head and lower it. And Milton lying in his iron lung watching said, oh, how I wish I could do that. Just raise my head and lower it. And as he thought about it, he imagined himself doing it. And guess what? He got a little movement. And that got him inspired. So from that point on, he not only watched her, his baby sister, he imagined himself doing exactly what she did. Now, these are some of the principles of organizing the brain, for one thing, but truly taking ourselves out of yatter, yatter, internal dialogue talk, talk, what's wrong, couldn't happen, isn't okay, terrible, awful, you know all the stuff. And instead, uh, he began simply being there and seeing her and then flashing on himself, doing what she could do. And in two years, he was walking just like she was. Now, the doctor said it was a miracle, but he knew that he discovered some fundamental principles of following your purpose, following your vision, following uh, and staying on track with what's important to you. And that became a source point 
of my beginning journey with Milton. Now, suddenly, uh, about 40 years ago, I hired an accountant who, it was a crazy thing to do, I didn't know very well. I didn't uh, check every one of his credentials. Someone said he's a good accountant. And that man stole all the money in my business, all in four other businesses and disappeared. And not only that, he ruined our uh, um, credentials and uh, uh, he took a lot of money from my students. <laughs> Big disaster. Um, visa cards, everything. And my business was ruined. So picture me sitting in my kitchen table. I'm saying, oh, what do I do now? It'll take them forever. You know, will they find him? Will I get my money back? And that's when I said, "What? well, maybe I could find something useful here. What could be useful in all this? Well, I've always wanted to, first of all, focus on coaching the heart of what Milton does. And secondly, call it after him. My inspired teacher. So I called my school Erickson Coaching International. Now that's how it started. It wasn't so great, but it was a good beginning for me, just like for Milton. When you follow your heart, when you follow your purpose, things work well. <laughs> wow. I hope you'll find a content someday anyway. <laughs> I found a great one later. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope, I, I'm sure he also got what he deserved. <clears throat> the one who stole well, your money. They never found him. Do you know that? <laughs> I did, really? Wow. Never found him. I'm sure he could somewhere else get in trouble, but. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. I, I didn't know that amazing story. I, I don't even know a bit of my background because I spent quite some of my prior career in public health. And oh, one of them yeah. is, yeah, so the other, the iron uh, law you talked about is uh, when I first knew about that device, I was very. I was very shocked and I didn't know there were the rows of them, right? So, you know, they're almost like a, a warehouse of them that you can put human beings inside. <laughs> it is, yeah, because there's one after another. I didn't know Milton's story was related to that. I was, that was eye opening. Thank you so much for sharing. And also, of course, your <laughs> own start. Um, well, I mean, it's probably too light to say it's a blessing in disguise because it is, it's, it's a very bad disguise. <laughs> but um, but it, you turn it, you transformed it into a, a new beginning. It, that's the, see, you know, sometimes what looks like the worst thing turns out to be something much better than we think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But of course, it, I guess the, 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 the uh, what we, typically underestimate is that this is not just some objective development it developed by itself it's actually developed or turned to be something good because of your choices um and your engagement in that um well then the, the second question i have is that you know like now you've been doing this for 40 years which is remarkable um as a career as a life journey um and but if you look back at the very beginning if uh, the first five years for example um, what were you trying to achieve <laughs> and uh, what were the, what, you know, how did it go? <laughs> well, oh gosh, what a question to ask me. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty, uh, the first five years were very difficult. The first seven years, even I was making all the money by traveling and teaching in other places and bringing it back and paying my own staff back in Vancouver to keep the whole school afloat. <laughs> so juggling a lot of balls, let's put it that way. And it so it tested my commitment. As you probably know, you know, our commitment means everything. You know, whatever we put our attention on, we get more of. 
And if we say, okay, I will stay with this another year and make it work. That's a declaration. Our declarations have great power. They have great um, resonance in our being. And so each time I recommitted, and even when I was saying, no, 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 inside, and I had my inner voice say, just stay with it. And with other people, you know, uh, you know, the truth was I was afraid that we wouldn't make it because we couldn't, uh, I, I was earning all the money myself. And we weren't yet really started in North America because uh, we we hadn't yet learned about how to work with the internet properly. It took, my husband had to discover a whole lot more about marketing. And uh, so my principle, you probably know the Gandhi principle, be the change you want to see in the world. So I kept envisioning what a big difference this work could make in the world. And yes, things started to blossom just like a lotus. <laughs> From mud to lotus. <laughs> Thank you. And then for that commitment or the declaration you've made, um, and you, you mentioned about we are afraid and then all those inner voices we have. I think that's probably the eternal, um, in, the eternal internal uh, battle like we face. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. Of, yeah, it was it was interesting because last um, now it's almost a month ago. I ought to interview uh, Mingo Rinpoche. So he's the adapted as the happiest man on earth. So he's a teacher, uh, a Tibetan Buddhist teacher from Nepal. Uh -huh. Yeah. And of course he has this, he always in his teaching, he talk about this, this monkey mind. Like we all always have a monkey mind and jump around and with all the, you know, noises and questions and, and, and um, that basically are in the way of your commitment or declaration. Um, since you talked about it, how do you deal with your monkey mind? Oh, well, uh, I actually spend a lot of time in my courses showing people how to deal with that. I, I use a little story to explain how I dealt with it. Um, I used to travel a great deal around the world. In fact, until recently, until COVID, I still did. And in the early days, I would sometimes be teaching in Russia. And uh, I come into one of those hotels. This is right after uh, Russia stopped being the Soviet Union. And I'm carrying my suitcases, coming in and setting them down in some hotel room. And then I notice there's a radio playing. And I look around for it and I can never find the Russian radio until finally on the edge of a door somewhere, just behind it in a corner along a ledge, I can see this little ledge and it's got two buttons. And one, oh, pardon me, it's got one button. The other one you can't actually shift, but the one button only turns it down. <laughs> That's a lot like our internal dialogue. So I'd immediately turn it down. It'd be somebody speaking loudly in Russian. I'd turn it down. And then it was always there in the background. <laughs> and on it would go. And then they'd finally turn it off. You know, they'd play the anthem and turn it off. And the next morning, opening my eyes, just a big, the anthem would play and on would go the Russian radio. <laughs> <laughs> so what I learned to do, and it was a really useful thing with my own internal dialogue, 
I would imagine that I could put all that internal dialogue behind the bone in the back of my neck. Try it. You can do it right now. And guess what? It disappears. You can just declare silence. And it's a, a deep form of meditation. Just be here now. What you see, just be the seeing, the hearing, the feeling right now. No words, no words. And notice you wake up, don't you? So that's yeah. what I do with it. <laughs> what about you? What do you do with it? <laughs> Thank you. I like that Russian radio. <laughs> it was so interesting. I'm I'm in Japan now, as you might know. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and I don't speak Japanese. Um, it's the same thing. I go out there, people are speaking Japanese. I was, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can understand some words now. But it's so interesting when I sometimes when I um it's similar to your story, actually it reminds me. Because um, I was reflecting my experience coming to Japan. Because I came um, a few months ago as a sort of visiting scholar. And one of the conditions for you to come is, like, you know nothing about the country. So they're, they're, they're inviting people who have, you know, some followership <clears throat> to live in Japan and do some. I think it's a brilliant design, by the way. I think it's great. But I was you know, reflecting on my experience coming to Japan. It's very interesting. It's almost like in a sci-fi movie, like you are dropped into the world where things are working, of course, and working smoothly And Japan is, a, you know, a well-run country. Um, so, you know, it's working. And then also at the same time, everything is so unfamiliar. Like everything is almost in the, like, like otherworldly, worldly kind of existence um so it it it's that state um that you you both know it's going to work and you know it's fine and also you know this is not your world <laughs> that kind of middle stage it's very interesting i remember i was um one time i have to do a transfer in a shinjuku station the station has 2.3 million people pass by every day this is one of the busiest uh, stations uh and i was of course i need to transfer so i was i stopped there i was looking for where i should go so but then i realized that moment like i'm i'm the only one who didn't seem to know where i'm going like everyone else are know exactly where they're going <laughs> everybody's busy is walking very fast i don't know if i sense of the tokyo subway like you know like you know, i was like wow this whole world is like well i'm the i feel like i'm the only one that's a bit lost like like it seems like everyone knows where they're heading. And, and of course I know where I'm heading as well. But at that moment, I don't know. I need to figure out where I am. But that sort of in-between stage <clears throat> is sort of the meditation for me. Like you both know it and you also know you don't know it. <laughs> like uh -huh. you also you both understand that things will work. Like even even if you walk into a Japanese supermarket or grocery store. Like 80% of things, I don't know how to eat. Like, you know, it's like, a, you know, if you visit a sort of exotic store, I mean, there, but also, you know, there must be some way to eat, eat it, right? So like, it just, it's not something like familiar to you. Um, and then it's that in between stage as well. It's like, and I think when you talk about kind of retreating back to the behind your bone, I often could sort of remind myself into, about, about that way of being because I think that's actually the way of being of it's a universal way of being it's just like even if we're in our familiar environment we are actually in a similar stage but but once you're kind of physically uprooted and put in a foreign environment where there's different language and different type of food and different way of operating that becomes very real um I think it's it's sort of that's the that's the way I stay out of the chattering. <laughs> it's a, a great method because in fact, you become the process of exploring yeah. rather than all the commentary about it. You're just in the process. You're curious. Yeah. 
you become yeah. the curiosity <laughs> and the eyes and the ears right. and the feeling. Yeah. Indeed. And I remind myself, like, this is the curiosity we should have about life. But but oftentimes when you're in a familiar in- environment, you kind of dropped it, right? So, like, I know exactly where this train is going. I know, like, you know, those are two trees, you know, outside the door. Um, and you lose interest in them. This is, okay, fine. Um, and when you're in a different environment, suddenly the trees are interesting because, okay, the trees shouldn't show up here. <laughs> so, like, but that we kind of lose that sense of I like your word. We kind of like lose the sense of curiosity when we are in a certain state for, you know, or we're kind of numbing ourselves. I think so. Like that sense of then, now, know. now you're onto it here, because in fact, have you ever, you know, been just out in an ordinary day? Maybe just going for a walk in a neighborhood you know really well, and you just wake up. Suddenly, everything looks like it might look in Japan. You see the tree is the essence of tree, and that flower is the most beautiful flower of being itself. You, I'm sh- Yeah, you're nodding. I know you know this. Everyone here knows it. We all know it. That experience of Ooh, there's a lot more to pay attention to when we just leave the internal dialogue, see, be the eyes that are seeing, be the seeing itself and the hearing itself and the feeling itself. I know, isn't that? That's the wonder of life. We are, yeah, we're all all too often put um, aside. Because we're too busy. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for that insight. So, so we talked about our first f- seven years, right? And then, um, can you share with us, like, a bit? What's your next milestone? Like, you could both be external milestone or internal milestone when you're building your business. Like, from the first chapter, you're keeping the company oh, of. Oh, I see. You know what's after we got going? Yeah. Oh wow. Well, that's an interesting question, because if we were to look at the game of life, as soon as you get something going and you get attached to it, then, and you get committed to it, then of course, this happens and that happens and everything hooks you and you get caught by this drama or that situation. So we're tested. I got tested a lot. Uh, I started opening Ericsson's in different countries. And sometimes it was easy. Sometimes it was wonderful. It was ice cream. It was terrific. And then sometimes there would be, I'd, I'd be invited to teach in a university in Europe or in some place. And I was told, okay, you got to bribe the president. You got to give him 5,000 bucks because... This, you know, what I mean, people have lots and lots of ethical issues in the world. So the question becomes, how do we stay in our truth? How do we stay with our purpose, even when people are hooking us one way or another or trying to? How many of you have faced that, everybody? So you uh, are committed. But as soon as you're committed to something, then you get tested. That's what happened to me. And also, um, uh, it it became a matter of how do I juggle so many balls? What is really worth my time and energy? And the further I looked at that, the further I realized that I had to go right to the essence of Milton Erickson's work with coaching and his ability to truly inspire people quickly. So I started working with ways that we can wake up quickly in this world. That's been my focus. We don't have a lot of time in the 21st century. We, you know, we can't sit in a cave like uh, a lot of our Tibetan Buddhist teachers could. It's a very complex world we live in. 
And we need to wake up, show up, be here, uh, and still be on track with being fully human. So you are tested ethically. Um, and I, I, I suppose that, of course, you know, make you review your purpose and intention um, more deeply, because that's that's where the testing are for. And also at the same time, <clears throat> you're saying, how do I basically improve the way you serve people, right? And then getting people wake up quickly. <laughs> this is where the internal dialogue comes in. Right. And, and this is where, in fact, it gets really hard. I mean, I didn't always succeed at this either. <laughs> Sometimes I got knocked right off my my surfboard, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, so the, so ahead. when you talk about, sorry, go ahead. You know, you go ahead. Oh yeah, no. I was saying when you when you talk about wake up quickly, I'm sure that got people interested. So, what are the ways for people to to wake up quickly? <laughs> oh. well, that's where I became very committed to the Erickson principles. See, the most important principle, as as far as I'm concerned, in the world, is to realize, as Milton said, that you are okay and even when you think you're not okay you're okay and that whole process of being not okay is just a way you're learning to balance on the surfboard of life and soon you'll come through it so the first principle is noticing that you know we are the light even when we're in the dark <laughs> <laughs> that the light and the dark are all part of being in the light. And that, in fact, we are okay. And we have resources. So the biggest resource is learning. And this is where coaching is so valuable. Because what people learn with a really good coach and with a really good coaching program is how to ask inner questions in such a way that you get in touch with your own deep, deeper knowledge, your own inner intuition, and you start to trust yourself. I, 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 is that a little bit like your experience? See, this is why being tested is so valuable. Don't think, oh, I wish it would go away and things would work out fine again. Uh, what's wrong with all this? Why shouldn't I get you know, the, the easy trip. Oh, none of us get the easy trip. So we just need to know when we're challenged that we're okay anyway. And this is part of it. <sighs> I know that's that's empowering. Um, that's the first thing I say as well to my, um, you know, workshop participants. I think number one is that you have everything you need to live a wildly successful life is the same thing. Like we have everything we need, but but the sort of years of either education or upbringing somehow planted this idea that we are deficient. Yeah, we don't we don't have all we need. We, you know we don't we don't look you know beautiful enough. You know we're not smart enough. We're not lucky enough, or we don't have this capacity, that capacity, and we our character has some problems that we could be more open like so basically that's kind of all like years of chantering right so like it's this is the 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 information the quality of information we're immersed in um so there's a deep sense of deficiency um so that's why when you say you are okay or what i'm trying to say as well um it is have to keep reminding ourselves that's you know that's the the more the universal truth and and when we have this belief, and sometimes this is also interesting, I don't know about uh, your education background, maybe we should get to that, but especially when this generation of Chinese growing up in China, there was this um, deep uh, preference for, for science and logic. And then therefore, 
if you just say you you got to believe it, people don't believe it. <laughs> they will say, hey, yeah, like, you know, you have to show me 10 evidences why I have to believe it. So like the whole thing about belief or let alone faith, faith is a, is a dirty word. <laughs> so like, so we, we kind of do away with the, the most fundamental things and we actually dismiss them. We're saying, you know, like you just come out and say there's faith or belief. Okay, this is not scientific. Okay, let's think, think about like, you know, the more scientific approach and the proof that once you have this degree and that degree, and once you score this much on math, <laughs> and that has a higher correlation with success in life. So I think that's a fundamental difference, which um, probably there's a bit of a cultural background there because I think the uh, the education uh, tone, the tone or context of the tone, it was it was that. So the whole thing about believing you're okay or believing you have everything you need become the biggest um, challenge or hardest thing. Do you find similar challenge in your clients as well? Well, uh, see, uh, I... I talk a lot about self-trust. So does Milton. And uh, the thing about self-trust is it's a, like walking on a light beam. You know, you, you, you don't know exactly what you're trusting, but you need to find a place in your heart where you feel it. It's, uh, there's, there's all sorts of ways to find self-trust. Sometimes I have people sit in one chair. We call it the conscious mind chair. And you sit there and you listen to all the logic go by about a certain topic where you're not so sure. But then go and sit in the beyond conscious mind chair. And this is a chair where you declare openness to your intuition. That's all. You just say, for the length of time I'm sitting on this chair, I am open to what my heart says. And as you sit there, you ask your question again, whatever it is. What shall I do about um, maybe this child who's having this difficulty, etc. Or whatever it is. And you listen to your heart. And you will be surprised that you start to get much deeper answers, much for, more profound wisdom. See, we're very wise as human beings, much wiser than we think. And all we need to do is listen inward. Now that isn't to disown the conscious mind chair. The conscious mind chair is really important, but think of all the things your conscious mind says and then all the things that your intuition says. And then put them together and just look at the list. Hey, I've got all these blessings. I've got these conscious ideas. I've got these beyond conscious ideas. Put them together and what do we get? And usually we get a real resource. We can say, yes, there's a whole lot more I know than I thought I did. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I think it's the same, the same thing. We're saying in Buddhism, they say we have, everyone have three treasures, right? One is everyone has awareness. Um, and second is everyone have love and compassion. And third one is wisdom. <clears throat> and those are three things. It's almost like three diamonds everybody have. Um, and, <clears throat> but, but sometimes it's covered in dirt <laughs> or it's buried inside, right? So like you're, 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 you're standing on top of it and trying to build a life and you feel you're poor, you don't have any resources, but you know, all the three priceless diamonds are just right under your feet. Um, I think that's why coaching or when you talk about, you know, the, the way to, I guess, quickly, or, you know, how we define is, is how do you, have people quickly realize, okay, those I have three diamonds down there. <laughs> and this is how I access them. Right? Metaphor. That's a great metaphor. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, uh, I'll be coming to China in three days. And I'm I'm actually one of the programs I'm teaching for Ericsson China is called Dream Work and Advanced Metaphors. And it's all about you can listen to your dreams and get the stories. And almost always, they will follow the heart if you learn how to listen to your dreams. And then you can create 
stories to support yourself, just like you did there, you know, that are ways of saying, remember, remember, remember. And once you do that, you can tell them to other people and they start to remember who they are too. Yeah, yeah. And Thank then we so don't much. get thrown mm. over by the logic. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, if we, if, we, if we don't mind going back to your journey. Um, so you were oh, tested right. and yeah, you and then, and then of course that goes, and then that leads you to improve your approach um what's the next milestone i'm curious like yeah like you <laughs> well when will i get to hear about your milestones it sounds like you've got some great ones too. well you have a much longer one so yeah more milestones so. <laughs> um, well well i i'm still being tested i'm sometimes i say people to people you know we've got three stages in life we're first a child and a child is just learning how to learn. And then we're a teenager and we're testing our learning all the time as a teenager. We're checking it out and we're distrusting this sometimes and saying, well, wait a minute here. Is this really possible? And then finally we grow up and we start to follow our principles. Well, I stayed a teenager for a long, long time. <laughs> Some people are a teenager into their 60s. So I was tested in my relationships, in my personal relationships. Uh, I've got a wonderful, loving husband at this point. But, you know, all of us go through various areas of our life where we get tested. And uh, I was tested physically. I've had this problem and that problem. And I've had to work with my physical awareness and I had to work with my relational awareness and I had to work with my intentional awareness what truly is my purpose what am I up to that's worth it and when we really stay noticing what where are the areas we're growing <laughs> then when something knocks us over we can find another way through so I kept developing programs for doing that. One of the things I discovered, and this is the next stage, is that the more I actually speak what I want to live from and declare it as if I'm always in it and say, yes, this is who I am, then I get to truly live it. So this is a deep principle. Milton Erickson spoke it. He said, pretend anything and you can master it. Pretend anything and you can master it. So don't just uh, believe the internal dialogue. Just say what you want to be uh, your life. Declare that is your life. So uh, you are okay. You have resources. When you declare that to yourself, you find them. So uh, I could go through all the ups and downs and ins and outs of Erickson. It's, it's been a great journey, though. Gradually, more partners, more people, more commitment but Marilyn keeps opening her mouth and talking and talking <laughs> and that's how I have learned mm. I'm studying brain science and I learned a whole lot about that just discovering what brain scientists have discovered about how people truly are okay I've been studying the nature of uh of physics of uh uh, the universe. I've been very, very interested in the nature of the whole galaxies and the universe itself and the black holes and the uh, huge holographic principle that we live inside of. And I have discovered that 
everything matches everything else. And so the more I discover this, the more I trust. And the more I trust, the easier it becomes. <laughs> so gradually, I've been going beyond my own cynicism. It's like riding on a roller coaster. Go up and then down and up and down. And then you commit to the whole ride. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there are so many uh, diamonds or jewels in what you just shared. When you talk about pretend anything and you can master it, it's very similar. So <clears throat> something I was sharing recently about wealth, because it's uh, especially for women, um, you know, when it, we, especially in Asia, I think people don't want to talk about money, uh, talk about wealth. Um, and one of the most important thing I learned myself is the same is you think I, I call it you think from it rather than you think of it I think similar to what you're saying so I think of it so, oh I know my neighbor who make that much money I think of the money they make or think of the life they have um, and the thing from it is that okay so if I want to be that like if I already have it <laughs> how would I be and how would I act and how would I behave um, and then that's exactly what you're saying. You pretend anything and can master it. That's so like the thinking from it is, I think is the, probably the biggest leap um, of our, uh, of both cognitively and of course, uh, um, deeply in terms of the inner awareness as well. Um, but that's, a, it's easier said than done uh, because when, like there's a common question is like, you know, is it they call it the imposter syndrome, right? Um, why me? Um, well, I don't have a credential. I don't have a PhD in psychology. <laughs> or I don't have 25 years of experience. So all the things will come up. And then that's, um, and those, are, again, of course, is part of the, uh, the cultural conditioning. Um, but the thinking from it, um, you know, that although it's just a change of a word, but it's, it's a gigantic leap. It's a leap of faith and leap of self um, definition. Um, what would be your advice for people who are afraid of making that leap? Uh, well, this is a really important question. May I ask you what you have done when you've been afraid to make that leap? Ah, thank you. Um, I had a whole book on it. <laughs> so I, uh, the book I published in China was basically... Oh, wow. Yeah, well, it's basically, if, well, if I translate it, it's, well, the subtitle, I mean, the, the title is where where do our strength come from or our power or strength come from. But the, the subtitle is basically explaining is by facing every fear. Um, yeah, at the end of the day is to face it, right? Because I think our, our it, the, the, to face it is the, is, is the shortest the shortcut. It's like the direct way there. But our intention is always to try to go around um, either go around or pretend it didn't ha it, it didn't exist or let's deal with that later um, and then that seems to give us a bit of a comfort um, but those comfort actually is 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 a deeper torture in disguise right because you're the, the question's still there and then the, the thought is still there the 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 lack of you know like you know you're something missing um yeah, so my my learning is to face it, but that's the deep, that's the tough, the toughest thing, um, because you you don't want to turn around. So I have this I, again using your the metaphor. I have a metaphor saying like it's almost life is oftentimes framed as if we're running, and there was a big sort of monster chasing us, right? The monster is is gigantic, is wide, and it's powerful, and but when we decide to turn around, if we decide to stop and turn around and stare at the monster, you'll realize it's just like a shadow. It doesn't exist. It's just like your shadow. Like it's it's not a real thing. And um, but if you don't turn around, the shadow is always chasing you. Um, so it's the biggest paradox, right? So like once you turn around, you'll know it doesn't exist. It's nothing. It's it's, it's void. But it takes that turning around to see that. <laughs> Otherwise, you you keep it keep turning. You keep running. So, so my advice sometimes to uh, to friends or to is is to start facing the small things because you okay I want to imagine I'm the 
president of the United States, well, that seemed to be a far stretch. Fine, don't start there, right? <laughs> start with something that's, you know, like, what if, you know, you're this tough neighbor who will just stand up to speak up? And that's fine, nobody knows you, and you can do that. And then how about stand up to say, okay, next time I'm not going to say yes to the request I don't want to say yes to anymore, do it and try it. And then two little steps. And the little steps, will often you will often real, realize it's much easier than you thought. Um, and um, I, I think that's sort of, that's that's my journey. I mean, uh, of course, first understanding it's just a shadow, but then start taking mini steps and then building almost the, the muscle, right? You're strengthening, you're, you're building your muscle every time you do it, and then it becomes more habitual. Um, and it's easier when you're facing bigger um, decisions. <laughs> oh, wonderfully said. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I, the one of the things I've discovered, I I told you I'm into shortcuts. <laughs> I'm into doing things fast, finding yes. easy ways to uh, go up the mountain, because uh, here we are in the 21st century and gosh, the waves are coming in on the shore real fast. And we need to learn how to balance in these boats quickly. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me, I discovered that Milton Erickson's visualizing process, when it's connected to the heart and the intuition, form a wonderful pair. And you can use visuals with the brain. If you study brain science at all, you, you'll discover that if you speak something like a question, an open-ended question about what you want, you know, I really want to discover what would be the best way for me to face this fear I have and really see beyond it what's really my purpose I, I don't know you know I'm just speaking words right now but as soon as you speak something truthfully and you put your shoulders back and you look up into possibility usually you'll get a flash a visual flash of something or even if you dream on it that night you'll get suddenly visuals and then you use your heart now i i also do something called the value-based self-image where once we know a time when i've been really empowered i remember how i moved and what i looked like and i see myself that empowered one and then i see that self in that future situation what would that self do this one who is awake and alive and thinks life is easy, who thinks life is ice cream. Because, you know, on the roller coaster, if we're in this point, we need to notice the whole ride. The whole ride is us, not just this point now, but the whole of our lifetime experience is who we are. So just see that you who really has that natural ability to face fear. See that you, what would that you do in front of these 5,000 people you're supposed to speak to? <laughs> I'm thinking of a moment, <laughs> you know, walking out on a stage in front of a lot of people. Oh, what would that Marilyn do? How would she move? How would she respond? And that starts to shift everything because we become what we see is our potential. Beautifully said. Yeah. What that, what would that Marilyn say? <laughs> Indeed, it's seeing yourself as visualization. I and mean, when we talk about visualization, so interesting. I had a talk with um one of a friend uh, one of my friends uh, she's uh her son um was a figure skater and was quite accomplished and then but she, he had a, a pretty uh disastrous moment and he had injuries and um so it's 
he he fight a lot to come out of depression and reappear on the on the ice rink. And he almost said exactly the same. So he said the whole process is about visualizing. Like, you know, instead of thinking, okay, will my knee be okay? Um, how will this hurt? It's about just visualizing you on the ice rink again. <clears throat> Uh, how you do that it's 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 you and uh, you you know you're the one in the hospital bed is you the one you visualize on the ice rink is you as well and then that visualization is the one that actually connects deeply connects and also empowers uh, the real you and then and, and I think that's especially touching because when you're doing something like figure skating is that I, I I'm sure you of course you use your brain but your moves are not controlled by your brain. It's not like you know one, two, three, and then four. It, it's 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 a flow, right? So the the flow is a higher stage of how the brain is functioning, and then that's where that visualization comes in, and so beautiful. And you see miracles uh, being made um, through that, which is exactly the same as as what you just um, shared. <laughs> Flow is what it's all about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me just show you something that reminded me. This is a book I wrote called Flow. I oh, it. there you go. <laughs> it's too close. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that one translated to Chinese yet? All of my books are translated into Chinese. Oh, I'm excellent. Saying, and uh, these books are the essence of what I teach. So, yeah. Curious about me. You can find out just by sneak, sneaking in and buying a book and seeing yes, what. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, well, when we make this uh, dialogue public, we'll, make, we'll list links for all your books there. Oh, um, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think for people who are interested in, well, can you share maybe, okay, now we are, I think I'm 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 on to the last part of my question. So now okay. you're, you're tested, <laughs> you're a roller coaster. And now you're like in year, you know, 40 of your career. And then if you review the last, let's say, I don't know, arbitrary, arbitrary if you review the last five years of Ericsson coaching and yourself, um, what's the difference now? Well, um, that's a very good question. I, it's really the essence of living so it all works for me uh it, it's important you know because i i believe the secret to happiness is not doing what you like to do it's liking what you're called to do hmm. and uh so actually things have not gotten lighter or easier it's not like now you know just uh, fanfare and celebration. It's the opposite. I've got lots to do and I'm still doing it. Uh, and I find that the more I'm able and it's the ability that I have to build, it's not easy all the time, but the more I'm able to actually um, deliver what needs to be said to the people who are asking for something to twig their real commitment. I think this is you too, from what I hear. As soon as they get, ah, she touched the heart that was important, that, that comment she made, that picture she created, is something that allows me to trust myself. I feel like I'm doing my job. And uh, so... I keep asking each day for the ability to keep going and making this happen, you know, and, and just appreciating that I can. Uh, I request humbly of the universe, hey, uh, just give me more time with this great um, um, ability that sometimes comes through me. Just give me more time with what people are asking and then i get to be happy i get to be very happy with my life the more we give away the more we get and so i look at my day and say what can i give away today 
<laughs> the thing about learning is the more you give it away, the more you get. <laughs> exactly. So it's not liking what you, it's not doing what you like, it's liking what you're called to do. Yes. Yeah, wow. That's very profoundly put indeed. And then um, it's the same. I also say the same. I think I, I put it in the uh, uh, opposite. I said, if you want to receive something, you give it first. It's the same thing. Yeah, like we, <clears throat> as I say, when we give, we actually receive a lot. And, but oftentimes people think, okay, that's just, uh, you know, just sounds right. Okay, this is, you know, sounds very noble. Uh, but actually it's the truth. <laughs> well, it's sometimes hard in our relationships, isn't it? You have right. a with your spouse and, and you're both sure you're right and you <laughs> need to pause and humbly appreciate that you get to live your life with this person and this is an opportunity for growth and take some deep breaths and just be grateful that you have this particular roller coaster you're on <laughs> And the same with our kids, our kids, what a challenge they are, right? You've got three children. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when, when you started your um, coaching company, how old were your children? Uh, I guess they were about 14 and 11. Ah, well, it's a what? tough time. That was, they were still pretty young. But right. it was, that was when I was still just learning how to teach. I was teaching psychology mostly. And I was uh, also doing psychology. So I was home most of the time. And then it's after that, you know, my son was about 16, 17. I started getting called abroad. I was flying here, flying there. And then it really began. Yeah. So <clears throat> you started when they were teenager and you started your own journey as a teenager. <laughs> well, my, my journey as a teenager was not happy. I had a very difficult childhood. I was beaten a lot. I ran away from home when I was 15. I came from a family where women were not educated. You were not supposed to try for an education. You were supposed to find a husband. And uh, that's what it was like in those days. I came from a farm family. They wow. didn't have any background and they had no subtlety either. There was a lot of uh, banging around in those days and difficulty. But I was very, very fortunate. I learned to read and I learned to love to read. So I would sneak under the covers with a flashlight and read books. And uh, somehow or other, I found my way through all that. You know, all of us find our way home, every one of us. And it doesn't matter how we start. The, all of those uh, difficulties provide real uh, essential learnings. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I didn't know about that piece that... Um that stretch of your life and then <clears throat> it must be quite tough because I think that's oftentimes people say that you know you spend um majority of your adult life trying to heal your childhood <laughs> <laughs> that's why I became a psychologist I mean <laughs> <laughs> you're a professional in doing that <laughs> And how did you meet, uh, since we're tracing back a bit, how did you meet uh, Milton Erickson? How did that interface begin? Oh, well, I'd, I'd been exploring this kind of therapy and that kind of therapy, again, wanting to fix myself, you know, uh, and none of it. It was all self-indulgent stuff. It was all about uh, you know, feel the pain and talk about it and tell how hard it was. And, oh, come on. It At that time, I believed it, but I discovered it really was that the more you put attention on something, the more it owns your mind. So if you're putting your attention on um, any kind of thing and making it real, it becomes more real. And in the middle of that, 
I found Milton Erickson, this guy with a great sense of humor. I started reading his books and he just simply told stories. And you might call them stories which just show how, pe not necessarily people, but how situations have another side to them. How it looks like one thing and turns out to be another. And that you can get a bigger picture. You can get an overview of all that. And look at your life from the beginning. You can look at your life from the end. You can look back at this moment. You can look, you look beyond this moment. You can stretch into the peripheral and really allow yourself to see and hear and feel all of it. Now, that interested me. That was more than I'd ever tried. It's not just getting into the tangle. It was getting out of the net and genuinely appreciating that our life has got a purpose. And whew, lucky me for reading those books. Wow, indeed. Were you able to work with him when he was alive? Just a tiny bit on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times. And I wasn't even working with him personally. I was with a group. Mm. And then he, when I went down to actually be with him, I was going to a conference. I'd save my dollars. Remember, I was not a wealthy person. And I was raising <laughs> children actually on my own. And uh, I went down, uh, I had my ticket spot and he died that week. I came down and was able to uh, climb the, the mountain where they threw his ashes and just really honor this great teacher of mine. And with that, really promise, I will do what you have shown me, Milton. I will live the kind of life which allows others to benefit for, benefit from my being alive. <laughs> wow, that's so touching. <laughs> well, so, you're were... <laughs> <laughs> so you're not able to see him. You have you you haven't met him in person. Anymore. I never got never. to look right directly into his eyes. No. No. Wow. But as you said, that's um you've you've brought his name, his teaching to so many people and and he must know. <laughs> well, he kept inspiring me and still does. When yeah. I, I I have a course called uh expanding emotional intelligence, and it's all about learning how to be Milton in your life with yourself. Oh. Mm. And uh, I'm very honored when I get to teach it. I'll, I'll I'll manage this trip to China to teach it. And also this course on dream work, which is really wonderful. Dream work and advanced metaphors. I find telling stories is a great way to remind myself. Yeah. Tell stories at the kitchen table to your kids. This is a good thing. Or yeah. your grandkids for me. <laughs> How old are your grandkids now? The youngest one is uh, 13, so they're growing up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, But the story was so interesting, what you, what you shared was similar. Uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, maybe not exactly the same, but I was very inspired when I read uh, Michael Singer's work. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I wrote an article about it in Chinese, and very accidentally, then it was... Um, it was uh, read by one of the publishers. And then so because of that article I wrote, they introduced his book into China and translated to Chinese. I think now they've sold over 200,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And it was very similar. I had this, I, I always thought that Michael Singer was already dead. <laughs> I was really ignorant because <laughs> when I read the book, all the all the story were like you know forty years ago, so I I thought okay that must be a dead author right and then <laughs> if Mike if Michael heard it please don't forgive me 
<laughs> and, then, yeah, and then I was like, wow. And then that was one day I remember what I said, you know, I should look him up. Maybe he's not. Like <laughs> and of course he's not. You know, he's pretty well. And then and that was last summer. So I, I wrote to him. I said, you know, I, I wrote I basically found his contact online and then it wasn't even him, like it was his publishing group that has his email. So I just sh sh said, I said, you know, I, I, of course, I didn't say I'm happy to find out you're still alive, but that was really what I was, <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> so I said, okay, you know, I played a small role in introducing your book to China, and I'm actually now in the States. And that was right at the end of COVID, um, mm -hmm. when traveling was okay again, was um, was a uh, summer before, summer of 2022, 21, 20, 2022, I forgot, 21, 22, uh, anyway, so so I said, you know, can I visit? And and they said, yes. <laughs> so I went, yeah. And then and it was it was it was I guess similar to what you said, because I, I never even never even occurred to me like I could go see him. And 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 I saw him, I did an interview with him, and I was put out. And then interestingly, actually very soon at the end of October, his second book is published, it will be published in China again. And the publisher actually used our interview. So like the interview I did that summer when I visited him in Florida, they actually put that interview into Chinese and used that, um, that was too long. They were used, hoping to use it as a preface, a preface, but it was too long. So they put it in the back. So that kind of lead to the publishing of the second book, um, which is coming up in a few days. Wow. I, I, I think that's kind of, it's, 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 of course, I mean, it's similar. I was like, wow, like, and, and if you you're 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 okay you want to reach out and things are usually there uh, <laughs> yeah but 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 yeah i guess in a way i'm probably more lucky i did see him i got to interview him but i can't totally connect with the feeling you just shared and then the emotion behind in a way a loss but also that loss enable um, a much broader giving yeah there's great power in just declaring that you will learn from someone and yeah. really meaning it and that you will take what they have offered. Who are your teachers, everyone in this call? Who are your teachers? Take what they offer and be willing to share that and be willing then to allow through them your own light to shine because it will yeah yeah beautifully said <laughs> thank you so much i think um i know your team has talked about so marilyn will have um his uh, her coaching classes and um available as well i think later on we'll connect with your team to see if there is any way we can help you promote oh well, i appreciate that yeah you're welcome to and our classes we'll yeah it sounds like we're kindred souls so this is great <laughs> okay i guess then thank you so much again marilyn for your time I say a word to you you know before i go yeah who you are is a prophet in your own time uh working for humanity in your own way and touching the hearts of a lot of people and uh, I'm beginning to learn why it's important to you and why you are taking so much effort to connect and be with uh, other ways that you and we can all make a difference to each other. So yeah. I really appreciate how you're doing this. And thank you so much for inviting me to your center. Mm, thank you so much, Marilyn. Yeah, well, I look forward to more uh, interactions with you. And then thank you so much for being open and flexible on this sharing and then um, sharing all your love and wisdom. <laughs>